All right, let's dive right into our first topic, the Paris Agreement. This is a big one, folks. The Paris Agreement is a global pact within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it's a critical player in the fight against climate change. Signed by 196 parties back in 2015, it's the first ever universal, legally binding, global climate change agreement. I mean, that's huge, right? <laughs> the primary goal of the Paris Agreement is to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, ideally to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. To achieve this, countries must aim to reach peak greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and then rapidly reduce them thereafter. We're talking about the drastic reduction of emissions here, folks, to achieve a climate neutral world by mid-century. This agreement also places a big emphasis on adaptation. It recognizes that many countries, particularly developing ones, are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. So it includes measures to enhance adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience, and reduce vulnerability to climate change. It's a tough task, but a necessary one. To ensure everyone's on track, there's a transparency framework in place. Countries are required to report regularly on their emissions and efforts to reduce them. But it's not all stick and no carrot. The Paris Agreement also aims to strengthen the ability of countries to deal with the impacts of climate change through financial support, a new technology framework, and enhanced capacity building. So in a nutshell, the Paris Agreement is a massive international commitment to combat climate change. It's about all countries pulling together to reduce emissions, adapt to changes, and support each other in this critical fight. It's not a silver bullet, but it's a crucial part of the solution. <clears throat> and it's up to every country every city, every business, and every individual to play their part. All right, that's the Paris Agreement in a nutshell. Let's move on to the next topic, shall we? So we're moving on to our second point of discussion, uh, the Kyoto Protocol. Now, let's not forget, before the Paris Agreement, we had the Kyoto Protocol, another major international treaty aimed that fighting climate change. The Kyoto Protocol was adopted in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan, and it was a landmark in the sense that it is the first agreement to legally bind developed countries to emission reduction targets. Yeah, you heard it right. It made countries legally responsible to reduce emissions. It <laughs> its main focus was on what we call the basket of six greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. Under this protocol, countries committed to reduce their combined emissions of these gases by at least 5% below 1990 levels over the commitment period from 2008 to 2012. But here's the interesting part. The protocol introduced innovative mechanisms like emissions trading, the clean development mechanism, and joint implementation. These mechanisms helped stimulate green investment and helped parties to meet their mission targets in a cost-effective way. You might ask, did it work? Well, the protocol had its ups and downs. While it did set a precedent for international cooperation and showcase that a global climate treaty was possible, it struggled due to non-participation and lack of enforcement. The US, for example, never ratified the agreement and Canada withdrew in 2012. <sighs> However, the Kyoto Protocol did pave the way for later agreements, most notably the Paris Agreement. It was a stepping stone, highlighting both the potential for concerted global action and the challenges inherent in such an endeavor. So, there you have it, the Kyoto Protocol in a nutshell. It was an important first step in the journey of international climate change policies and regulations. Now, let's move on to our next topic, shall we?
Okay, let's move forward to our third topic, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, as it's commonly known. If you're thinking this sounds important, you're absolutely right. The UNFCCC was adopted in 1992, and it's often considered as the foundation for global climate governance. The aim of this convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous interference with the climate system. It's important to note that the UNFCCC is a framework convention, a broad outline really, which means it doesn't set binding limits on greenhouse gas emissions for individual countries, and it doesn't dictate how countries should reduce their emissions. Instead, it provides a platform for negotiations to establish specific international treaties or protocols that set binding limits on greenhouse gases. One of the most impactful contributions of the UNFCCC is the establishment of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. This means that while all countries should contribute to climate action, developed countries, which historically have contributed more to climate change, should take the lead. It's kind of like saying those who made the biggest mess should do the most cleaning, right? Under the UN province province, we've seen important treaties like the Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement come to life. It also established other mechanisms, like the Green Climate Fund, which we'll talk about next, to help developing countries in their climate actions. So the UNFCCC, in essence, is the mothership of international climate cooperation, setting the stage and the rules for how countries can and should work together to tackle climate change. It's not a solution in itself, but it gives us a structure a framework to find those solutions together. All right, that's the UNFTCC for you. Let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Let's head straight into our fourth topic, the Green Climate Fund. Now, if you're wondering what this is about, well, it's about money, but not just any money. It's about financing the global response to climate change. The Green Climate Fund, or GCF, was established in 2010 by the countries who are part of the UNFCCC. The aim here is to assist developing countries in adaptation and mitigation practices to counter climate change. So how does this work? Essentially, the GCF pools financial contributions from developed countries and then invest them in projects and programs in developing countries to help reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, it's like a global piggy bank for climate action. Now the GCF is a pretty big deal. As of now, it's the world's largest dedicated fund for climate change. It's got more than $10 billion in pledges, and it's already funding a whole range of projects, from renewable energy installations to climate resilient agriculture. But what's really cool about the GCF is its focus on a balanced approach. It's committed to a 50-50 balance between its mitigation and adaptation investments over time. This means it's not just about reducing emissions, but also about helping communities adapt to the changing climate. The Green Climate Fund has a crucial role to play in supporting the global ambition to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's about mobilizing the needed finance, transferring technology, and building capacity in the developing world to respond to the climate crisis. So that's the Green Climate Fund. It's all about supporting countries that need it most to do their part in the fight against climate change. Now let's move on to our final topic, shall we? All right, let's dive into our final topic for today, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC as it's more commonly known. Now, if you're curious about where all the data and scientific evidence on climate change comes from, the IPCC is your answer. Established in 1988, the IPCC is an international body for assessing the science related to climate change. 
it's not a research organization itself, but examines and assesses the latest scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information produced worldwide. So what makes the IPCC so crucial? Its assessments provide a scientific basis for governments at all levels to develop climate-related policies, and they're a key input into international climate change negotiations. Basically, the IPCC is the backbone of global climate science, providing us with a clear understanding of the most up-to-date knowledge about climate change. One of the IPCC's major achievements is the periodic release of comprehensive assessment reports. These reports embrace yourself. They're massive, like thousands of pages, massive, <laughs> detail the state of knowledge on climate change. They cover the scientific basis of climate change, its impacts and future risks, and options for adaptation and mitigation. The IPCC's work has been fundamental in raising awareness about climate change. Its fifth assessment report, for instance, stated with 95% certainty that humans are the main cause of current global warming. That's a level of certainty equivalent to the scientific agreement that cigarettes are harmful to health. <sighs> In 2007, the IPCC was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such change. So, in a nutshell, the IPCC plays an indispensable role in informing policy decisions and international negotiations on climate change through its rigorous and balanced scientific assessments. It's the go-to source for anything you want to know about climate change science. And that, my friends, concludes our exploration of the role of the IPCC. It's been a whirlwind tour of international climate change policies and agreements, hasn't it? Ha, 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 ha.